Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. Before we jump into the questions from last week's videos, I did want to announce the winner of the 75th edition Felco 2 pruners. So we announced this giveaway in last week's recap. We had a ton of comments, close to 7,000 comments on that video. So congratulations to Carol Lewinson. You have won the pruners. We responded to your comments, so we we're just waiting for a message back from you, so be looking for that. Um, also, we are technically less than one week away from due date for baby girl, so recap videos are going to cease to exist for at least a few weeks. I'm not really sure what it's going to, I'm actually not even sure what this week's going to look like because, like, <laughs> I'm feeling it. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell, but I just am like, oh my goodness, the insomnia is just, like, sleep torture is a thing, man. Anyway, I mean, we, I'm thankful for the weather. I mean, you can see it's bright outside and the sun is shining the last few days and that's so, so helpful to me. Um, but yeah, so I don't know what the next few weeks are gonna look like, but we do have a lot more help this time around. With Benjamin, I was just like, ah, oh, we got it. We don't need help, it's fine, you know? And now I'm like, who wants to sign up on the sign up sheet to come up, <laughs> like, I don't know, work a shift <laughs> at our house. <laughs> um, so we're gonna have lots of help from my mom and. Aaron's mom and some friends and yeah. So I think it'll be, it'll be much easier this time. Well, <laughs> I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> it'll be different, but it'll be, we'll have help. So anyway, we also have next week, uh, some days close to 50 degrees. So my mom was talking about getting in some spring flowers early, um, which makes me happy. I mean, just like, I, I hope we can just like bring baby girl along and plant up some spring pots. Maybe next week. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> okay, let's jump into the videos from last week. The first one was winter sowing for 2021. So in that video, I just explained winter sowing and um, kind of gave my experience or my um, my take on winter sowing from last year. It was the first time I'd ever tried it, and it's a thing. Like people swear by this method, and tons of people do it. There's lots of videos out there about it, and lots of blog posts, lots of information everywhere about it. And I just thought, you know what, I think this is such a cool thing because it eliminates the need to have expensive equipment, grow lights, it doesn't take up any room in your house. Um, I think it really solves a lot of problems that people can run up against when they want to start seeds. Um, because you're starting them outside. So you're using some kind of container that's either clear or like I used uh, recycled water jugs, which are kind of like a like that uh, frosted, so the light still penetrates the container, but you plant your seeds out really early and they're allowed to kind of wake up almost normally, but they're still protected a little bit. And um, last year I had a fair amount of success, but I was able to implement some changes that you guys suggested that I'm hoping that I have even more success this year. And like, why not? You know, in January, um, if you can save some containers throughout the year, why not toss some seeds in them and just try it? I mean, I've got a full blown setup for grow lights and seed starting trays, and I start a lot of stuff that way. But I also enjoy starting or trying out methods like this because I think it's, it's fun. So Mitzi said, what is, a, what is a good company for buying good quality seeds for vegetables and flowers? Um, so I order from several different places. Of course, I get a lot from my parents' garden center and they do have an online uh, store. So we'll link them down below. I also get a lot from Johnny Seeds. I think that's probably my number one. I get a ton from them. Um, uh, Florette Flower, or I think that's, so floret.com, floretflower.com, we'll link all of these. Um, I have gotten a lot from Baker Creek, uh, Eden Brothers. I know MI Gardener's got a pretty extensive line now, doesn't he? Yeah. I haven't looked it over this winter because I was so, like my seed stash is kind of embarrassing at this point. <laughs> uh, but anyway, those are some places to get started anyway. Renee said, just curious, how do you check on the moisture if you don't open the water jug? Do you use a moisture meter? No, I don't. I actually don't love moisture meters. I've never had one that's worked really well for me. Um, I go by look and or heft. So like, you can know, you can pick up a container and be like, that is full of water. Or you can pick it up and be like, I need to refill it my water. I mean, you can kind of tell based on weight after a certain amount of time, how much water is in that container. Uh, did, oh, you can use a skewer too, like a wooden skewer, like oh, a yeah. shish kebab thing. Stick that down in there. Cause I think those are plenty long enough to get to the bottom of a, like a water jug and then draw it, like let it sit there for just a couple seconds and then draw it back out and see how much moisture is on it. Denise said, just a quick question, would the container material change the growing process 
if it's clear versus frosted. I was thinking of using clear OJ containers for aesthetic purposes, but not sure if that would make the container hotter or retain additional moisture due to it being clear. What do you think? I honestly, like I haven't tried clear ones, but I don't think it would make any difference whatsoever. You're gonna be dealing with so much condensation on the inside of that container, it's gonna look frosted anyway. So I think you could use that frosted or clear. That is my uneducated opinion on that. Are you basking in the sun? I'm loving it right now. Yeah, you're like just... I'm so, <laughs> Aaron is so just like, it up. Yeah, he's loving his life right now. <laughs> Anne said, are you using the Sharpie Extreme Markers? No, I was using a regular Sharpie, which I now know from the comment section that that was the wrong way to go. I actually have some markers that are called garden markers that work really well, and I just didn't grab one. I was being lazy. There was a Sharpie already in the studio like nearby where I was gathering uh, equipment and supplies and I was like, eh, I'll just use this, it's fine. <laughs> um, Anne said, have you tried using kitchen tongs to get your seedlings out? No. And I actually think that that's a really legit idea. I might have to try that because you can just get in there and just like pinch them out. We'll see. Uh, Rosemary said, could I plant garlic using this method? If so, when would they be ready to harvest? Um, I am not sure. I was thinking about that and I don't know if, I mean, it would make sense because I plant mine in the fall and then it sits through all of the winter moisture that we get, which this year has been kind of like, we've had a lot of rain this year. Um, and they're fine. Like they start growing in the fall usually, and then they sit there and then they start growing in the spring again. And I've never had issues with them rotting out. Um, that would be my only concern is if you don't have proper drainage in your container, if a uh, garlic clove is sitting there in too much moisture, it could possibly rot. But since that's how we normally plant them and they're getting moisture outside anyway, I think it's worth a shot. Uh, Rigav said, do you water them from the top after and make sure it's just the right amount? Um, so we used pre-moistened potting mix and then we planted the seeds and then we watered it, like kind of settled the seeds in with a spray bottle and then closed them up. Typically that is enough and typically you don't have to water them anymore unless you live in a really dry climate Which we do have long stretches here where we don't get any moisture at all So sometimes I find myself needing to supplementally water these these containers in which case I just stick the Spray bottle right in the opening on the top and just spray inside just give it a good spray and that's it. It's pretty easy um, Most of the time though, I mean if they're getting snow and rain they're getting enough moisture to just you can basically just leave them alone. Jerry said, what were the pink flowers and pots on the ground to your right as you were planting? That is the proudberry coral berry. It's a shrub. Uh, Bella said, can you tell me where you purchased the cutting tool to splice the milk jugs? I was actually gifted that um, by one of you guys. I opened it in the mail time. I cannot remember the brand. I think it's inside in the drawer. That blue one? Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. It is nice. It feels really comfortable. I'll try to look at and see if there's a brand on the tool itself and we'll link it down below if I can find it. Uh, Jamie said, we just built an unheated greenhouse. Can I use this method in place inside the greenhouse? Absolutely. The only thing that you're going to have to make sure to do is water them because if you don't have them outside, then they're going to be completely dependent on you to water. They will probably be slightly ahead though of the ones that you put outside, which is good and bad. The other good thing about winter sowing is that you have seedlings that are really um, acclimated to the weather, weather and you don't have to harden them off. So if you've got them in a greenhouse, then you're gonna have to water them yourself and then you'll probably have to spend a little bit of time trying to acclimate them to the outside weather. But wouldn't, totally doable. Wouldn't you say that that's all you're doing is just creating little greenhouses like little for all frame. your, yeah. like little cold frames for all the yeah, little mini. seedlings? Mm -hmm. Quinn says, would this system work for a northern Midwest winter? I have a container garden since I live in an apartment. I could put the seed starters on my deck, but would it be okay in below freezing and even negative temperatures? Is the risk of the jugs freezing through an issue? Well, the whole goal of winter sowing is being able to start things, especially this early, like hardy perennials that are already living through temperatures like that and self-sowing annuals that typically spread their seed and then they lay dormant, the seed lays dormant through the winter and then picks up and starts growing once it gets warmer in the spring. Hold on, <laughs> Russell. <laughs> He's li liking the blanket I have on my lap right now. Oh. Which I don't even really need, it's so warm out here. So you wanna look for keywords on seed packets like um, self-sowing annual, hardy perennial, hardy or cold tolerant annual. Um, 
if the seed requires a stratification or a cold period, which usually means you have to toss the seed in your freezer for three to four weeks, um, well, anywhere from one to four weeks, uh, in order for it to be kind of um, spurred, spurred, encouraged, encouraged into uh, germinating. So look for those types of things on seed packets. You can also start warm season stuff, but you just want to wait a little bit longer. And if you Google winter sowing, there are scads of websites that'll give you um, lists of seeds that you can start and when. Typically for the hardy perennials and self-sowing annuals, you can start those after the first day of winter. Uh, next video was unboxing some fun garden stuff. So we had a couple of boxes show up from Proven Winners and it was a really crummy day outside. It was windy and rainy and we thought, oh, this is perfect for inside the studio. And there was some fun stuff like some eco pots. There are seed starting containers that break down over time. They kind of feel like plastic, but they're not. Um, so they hold up better than peat pots do. And then they will fully break down in your soil over time. And so I was really excited about that because they are um, just exploring different ways to eliminate plastic waste because there's an enormous amount of it in gardening if you think about it all of the plant containers and seed containers and all of those things which can be reused um, i mean you can sterilize them and reuse them again from year to year but i think uh, for the most part they're not being utilized that way they're being tossed in most cases so it's a it's an exciting thing to see happening so Lisa said, why do, the, why do the berry treasure seeds say annual on the website? Are they perennial in some zones? Yes, they are. And I don't know why they say annual, to be honest. I asked and I can't remember what my, the response was. I think it was some type of like a political reason that they couldn't do it. I don't remember the exact thing, but you know how like there's all sorts of restrictions on yeah. how, how you're supposed to label things. And I seem to remember it being something really dumb and political. Uh, um, maybe it was. But, but I can't remember. But I think they're a zone, let me look, a five through something. No, a four through nine. So they are plenty perennial enough for most yeah. zones. And they're great in our zone. I mean, we're technically a six now. We plant like we're a five. Although like this winter, I mean, what was our, we had a nine to, no, that was last year. Last I think year. this year, if we doesn't get any colder than it already has, I'd probably say we're a zone seven this year. Yeah. If every, every winter was like this year, right. we'd be a zone seven. We're like high twenties and in the thirties and sometimes above freezing. Mm -hmm. In January. Yeah. That's super, super weird. Anyway, they've been surviving our zone really well over the last couple of years. And I do have to say, and I have said, I think I've even said this in the video, but the second year on those buried treasure strawberries is the best year so far. Um, first year, you get some berries, but they're kind of small. And I, I felt like the flavor wasn't quite there the first year. Last year, though, I got so many strawberries so many and the flavor was really good i don't know what the deal is but it's like they kicked it in and um, i'm hoping that this next year is just as good patricia said i ordered some seeds from proven winners if i don't need or use them all can i save, save them for next year absolutely keep them in a, like a drawer somewhere that's dark and cool and they won't get wet and they'll be fine christina said is it possible to continue growing any of the smaller tomato types inside under a grow light and if so how would one go about doing that Yes, it's absolutely possible. You just want to make sure that they get plenty of light and get plenty of nutrients so that you're fertilizing them consistently. Um, you can put them, like I would, I would do a grow light and a southern exposure window if you can. Like just hit them with as much light as you possibly can um, and you can continue to grow them. And since I started those tomato plants so, so early, um, I, it'll be interesting to see like if I can bump them up in pot size and maybe try to get some production out of them. Alan said, why don't you do a test and put one of those pots in some soil and keep it moist and see how long it takes to break down? Another winter project, project besides having a kid. <laughs> it's a small <laughs> You already have a little bit of a winter project. project. Yeah. I, I actually think that that's a really good idea. And, you know, I, I mentioned that I think Proven Winners is in the, has it in the works to put their annuals, like in the Grande white container. Um, they are trying to see if they can do the same kind of eco pot situation with those. Um, so I've asked them to send me some as soon as they're ready and I want to do some testing here and I just want to like plant some annuals in the ground in those pots and then plant some just with no pots and just see the difference. I think it'd be really interesting. That seems way more exciting to me than the seed starting, uh, pots. The oh, grandes. the annual? Yeah. 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 Because, yeah. We go through quite a bit more of those than I do seed starting containers. Uh, Butterlight said, how hard is it to grow strawberries from seed? I'd love to see a video about that. What if we don't get a good long freeze? Do we put the package of seeds themselves in the freezer? Yes. Do we put them in a seedling tray and put that in the freezer? 
Uh, you can just put the seeds in the freezer. And honestly, like I did my strawberries in my winter sowing out there and I think it's gonna be perfect for them. However, I have started strawberries from seed before, not this variety. Uh, and I, I didn't even know at that point that they needed a stratification or a cold period and I didn't give it to them and they came up fine and I got strawberries. <laughs> so I don't know, <laughs> like I started them in spring and it could have just been a fluke deal. Um, but definitely follow the instructions on the seed packet for best success. Roseanne said, when starting seeds, why do you poke one hole and put in two seeds? Wouldn't it be less stressful for the more viable seedling that you keep to poke two holes and put one seed in each hole? And that's absolutely a like, great idea. Um, it's just a little bit of an extra step, which honestly, it's not a lot of extra work. Um, when I thin my seedling, so I go in with scissors or pruners and just cut that, um, the one I don't want to keep off at the base and that just stops it from growing. So I'm not like pulling it out and disrupting root systems at all. I'm just clipping it off and letting the, the nicer ones stay. Uh, Debbie said, you didn't show us what else was in that box. I know it looked like there was more stuff in the auger box, I think, because when they packed it, they put some empty boxes in there to like hold everything in place. And it looked like there was three I think three additional boxes that I didn't open, but they didn't have anything in them. Tiffany said, I've always loved the idea of pots that break down in the ground, but I don't trust that there isn't something in them that I don't want in my soil, especially with corn and sugar beets as those are heavily sprayed with chemicals in the USA. Lesser of evils? I don't know. Definitely one to think about. Really looking forward to seeing those seeds grow, especially the yellow tomato. And that's a completely le legitimate question. And I also noticed somebody else ask about the possibility of GMOs being present because uh, these containers are made from crops like corn and sugar beets where there are GMOs being grown. Um, and so I reached out to Proven Winners because I didn't know how to answer those questions and they are legitimate questions. I mean, you want to know if you're trying to grow organically, yeah. you don't want to like think, oh, I'm doing such a good thing for the environment by getting these pots that break down and look at me, you know, and then like introducing all this whatever into the soil. Um, so they did email back, right? Yeah, you they read did. That? So, you, do, you, do you have the abridged the, version? Yeah, it's so, so good at explaining stuff like this. Sure. So I think the key is that it's derived from corn. It is not corn. So they used an analogy that's a little bit morbid, but it, I think it's a really good analogy that um, if someone dies and you were to cremate that person, they had DNA, but when they become ashes, they no longer have that same DNA. Mm. Um, it's a new product. Mm -hmm. So in the same way, these are derived from corn, not the kernels, however. It's just like the roots and the husks and... Roots and rootstocks is mm -hmm. what I read, I yeah. think. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not, it's not the actual kernels. Mm -hmm. So yes, you know, the, primarily in the U.S., a lot of corn is sprayed... Uh, you know, with pesticides and stuff, and it also is GMO. Mm -hmm. However, this is kind of a new product, mm -hmm. and it's a byproduct of those things. They even sent over, and I'm going to bring it up, it's from... Yeah, a certification. Um, a certification from... Uh, oh, geez. CGS North America. It's an analytical... It's like a whatever. Um, they t do a bunch of testing, and there was not even any corn DNA present. <laughs> like, um, So there's like a legit test that I have here. Um, that explains that. I so. think the point that they're trying to get across is that it's derived from natural products uh -huh. as opposed to, you know, it's not plastic. It's not, it's like we're trying to use things that would ordinarily be, right. I don't know what they would do with corn, just turned into silage. It or? probably kills them that they're not white pots though too. But to get a white pot, you'd have to add in non-natural ingredients. So like these seed containers are kind of like a tan color. Uh, also, we got a photo, which I could probably put on the screen. It shows variation in color. So oh. even within the pots, you're going to see some that are more white and some that are more yellow and more mm -hmm. brown. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be consistent because of the natural right. uh, element. In so them. basically, in the end, there's no worries. You're not introducing anything bad into your soil. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a way to use a container that will break down, but not as fast as a peat pot. Hopefully, it'll break down. Hopefully. We still I, need to test that. Yeah, we do need to test that. And also, I think um, one of the things, one of the arguments too, is like pea pots are awesome, but the the method that they're going about to make these seed starting pots, um, uh, what what was the? I, I thought that this was really a good thing. Um, oh, that corn is renewable in, in the sense that it can be grown annually. Corn is grown annually. Trees are harvested every thirty years, and then peat moss fields take one hundred years to reharvest. I actually read so, a stat on peat moss that it grows 0 0.02 inches per year. Really? And so it grows so slowly that it's considered a non-renewable resource. Wow! But it does grow. It does grow, but hardly. Right. 
Okay. I hope that that clears some of that up. It's all, it's always interesting to learn that kind of thing. And that's why we love to share stuff with you guys. Cause we're learning about it at the same pace, basically that yeah. you guys are and learning those are together. Great questions actually. Yeah. They those are. were really good yeah. to find answers. Okay, so next video was antiquing with my mom and sister, which I <laughs> I told Aaron like I don't know, this is kind of this is kind of out there. It's kind of veering away from garden content, and we try really, really hard to keep things focused on gardening. While like especially right now, it'd be really easy to not because one, it's winter, and two, I'm like kind of infirmed at the moment. I can't do a lot of big gardening projects. In fact, like she is moving around so much right now, I'm like oh. I thought they stopped moving a little bit when they got big, but she hasn't. Um, anyway, my sister was down from Washington where she lives, and she actually expressed some interest in going antiquing, which she is not a big antiquing type of person. So my mom and I were like, yes, we're going to go. And I thought you guys might like to come along. And the encouragement I got from you guys was awesome. I think it was kind of it was kind of needed last week. It was Last week was a tough week for, I think, everybody. Um, so just, I think the general consensus was just seeing something normal, um, and seeing just kind of a lighthearted video was, was nice. So anyway, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Uh, Terry said, this was so needed on this day, even more than a green video. It, um, it was wonderful watching someone having a really pleasant day with people they enjoy. Thank you for making the effort to film and share with us. And that's exactly kind of what I heard over and over again, um, which was really sweet. KLC PCA said, oh Lord, you can tell Laura and I come from different worlds. She bought champagne buckets and I'm thinking, why did she buy spittoons? <laughs> My grandpa had a spittoon. Whoa, yeah. serious? Yeah. Like so a real he, one? He chewed for a lot of years and he had a, like a kind of a, a, it was copper, but it was all battered up. Like it was all dinged up all over on the sides and he'd keep it by his chair. Oh. And I remember like it had a specific smell. Yeah, I bet it would. Oh yeah. He doesn't do that anymore. But yeah, uh, these champagne buckets definitely look a heck of a lot better than his spittoon. <laughs> Sister Christian said, what a fun trip out with you three girls. You must have the black furry hat. Yeah, a lot of you guys thought I should have that hat. I am partial to like, I like my jackets always have like a faux fur uh, edging around them. I kind of like that look. It was kind of a fun hat. Uh, Thanks for taking us along for the ride. What did you leave behind uh, that you regret not picking up? Oh man. You know, I, I hardly ever regret leaving something behind. I don't know. I always feel like um, if I left it behind, I left it behind for a reason. And maybe I need to think about it for a little while before purchasing it. And if it's not there the next time, it's totally fine because there's going to be something else better that I'll find later. And I'm trying to think if there was anything that day. Like, I know I showed you that beautiful mirror and um, bed frame at the last place we went to. The bed frame would not have fit in our guest bedroom. It was a king size, which is really rare to find in uh, an older bed. Um, so I knew I couldn't fit that. So I didn't regret that. The mirror, however, I don't know. I'm still thinking about that, but it was kind of expensive. It was, I think it was between three and $400. And for a mirror, I'm like, oh, <laughs> I don't know. I have to think about things like that for a while. Uh, Lauren said, okay, what's a Mexican mocha? And Mexican mochas are a chocolate and espresso-based drink, but there's cinnamon in it and something else. Hold on. Let me just, like, look up the ingredients of a Mexican mocha. They're not all the same, though, because this place at the Village in Meridian, um, it's the best me Mexican mocha I have had. So rich chocolatey mocha with a kick of cinnamon and spicy heat. A rich blend of coffee, cream, cinnamon, nutmeg, and cayenne pepper makes this warming beverage even more stimulating. It must be really light on the cayenne because I don't really make that out so much, but it is, it is delicious. <laughs> you guys should try one if you can. Uh, Ellen said, I love your mom's sunglasses. Where did she get them? I gave those to her. Actually, we got those in the mail time from a company that makes the glasses. Um, and it was in the mail time that the thumbnail shows me in like the Harry Potter looking glasses. It came from the same place. Um, but they didn't really look that great on me, and so I asked her if she wanted them, and I think they look good on her, so win-win. Uh, Brienne said, wouldn't that look pretty as a collection? Now we just need to find one more. Sounds like me and my mom. And my mom is such an enabler. Um, like, I buy way more stuff when she's with me than when she's without me. In fact, Erin kind of, like, encourages our shopping trips because I am the type of person who will leave a room completely undecorated for years because I haven't found quite the right thing and I don't want to just put any old thing up on the wall. But Erin is like, 
you want to see holes filled. It doesn't matter what it is. Like he would go and like go to just some. No, I wouldn't. You think I would do that, but I wouldn't. Okay, <laughs> well, you don't even know what I'm gonna say. I know what you're gonna say because you've say? said it before. You're gonna say I would just like fill it up with any old thing, but I wouldn't. I would Not fill it up with all thing. the things that I like. I think that you would go down to a furniture store and you would buy sets. That's what I could see you doing. Like this set mm, is for this room, I would and do then this of, bedroom set is for this room. And mm, I don't like sets of anything. No, here's what I would do: is I'm I'm very much a copycat. So I would get on like Instagram or Pinterest or whatever, and I would find rooms that I liked, mm -hmm. and then I would do whatever I can to basically like copy a design. Mm. And it wouldn't be exact because there's a really good chance I wouldn't be able to find the same yeah. pieces. But I could find all the elements of things that I liked, and I think I could really quickly get what I wanted by just researching where to find the things that I like. But the things that Aaron likes would be brand new things. They're not antiques. You don't, you're not like an antique. No, it's not true. I do like, yeah, I do like that, antiques. You are totally being different, Aaron. <laughs> He's being a different person right no. now, everybody. You are. I think, I, here's what it is. I think that you think that I would do like this like mid-century modern house. No, I don't think so. I think you would do Joanna Gaines. No, I don't like the farmhouse style. I don't either. I like more of like a colonial, I like the library look, like a dark, you sure. know, kind of well, library Sure. Well, we got a lot look. of that going on. Yeah, I like... Um, so, I'm doing something right. I like a lot of wainscoting. <laughs> yeah, um, molding. I like, I like leather furniture. I know you don't like leather furniture. Well, the but... reason why I haven't liked leather furniture is because of our dang cats. Cats and leather furniture just like, you should see our chairs in the front parlor. They are just like, they're damaged big time. It just doesn't work. I also don't like to stick to furniture. Not a huge fan of that. It's like so not warm. I like the look of it. I agree with you there. Like it is beautiful. Yeah. But I like to, I like to be cozed. Cozed. <laughs> in the furniture. Yeah. All that said, if I go shopping with my mom anywhere for anything, clothing, antiques, whatever, she's like, you have to have that. Oh, you've got to have that. And it just like is totally encouraging and I fall for it every time and I buy lots of stuff. Uh, Dr. Kirsten Bible said, my heart melted into a puddle when Benjamin said, I miss you. That was really sweet. Oh, he's the sweetest, most tender little boy ever. Um, yeah, I, I really can't wait to see what his reaction is to his baby sister because he talks about her all the time and he kisses her. He kisses my tummy and he, he talks to her. Um, so I think he's grasping it on some level. I mean, of course he won't, he can't grasp it completely. Um, and his world is about to be rocked. Like... Aaron and I were talking this morning, like, this is the last Monday. We're going to be a family of three. It's so weird. Crazy. So weird. Yeah. Uh, Diana was here, or Diane was here, said, phrase of the day, it's so pretty. <laughs> okay, so I have to say, um, I was wa watching that video back, and I think there was one section where my mom and sister and I said, it's so pretty, over and over so many times, I ended up cutting a bunch of them out and there was still a bunch of them in there. And I thought, oh, we're going to get the comment, like, everybody take a, sh you know, take, take a drink. A shot, yeah. yeah. When they say it's so pretty. So our, our videos go through several layers before they are ever published. Um, so, like, I filmed that video and then it goes to our editor, Ken, and Ken edits it. And he usually leaves a lot in there um, just knowing that we'll probably uh, pare it down even more. And then either Aaron or I watch it next. I, I think in this case, I watched it after Ken edited it. And then I did some editing myself and I took out a bunch of like, random things that we said and um, a lot of it's so pretty. So that comment kind of cracked me up because boy, we used that phrase a lot that day. Anna said, how wonderful to have that relationship with your mom and sister and all um, that all love antiquing. My daughter, 27, not a huge fan. Like I said, my sister Monica is has not been... Uh, a fan of antiquing in the past but I think she's just now starting to get into it which will be really it'll make our trips really fun because we'll have something else to go do because typically when Monica comes down we don't like my mom and I we don't go antiquing because she's never, never really liked it um so it was a really fun day and the fact that she actually had like a mission of things she wanted to find and she found it she found a set of pewter dishes and she sent me pictures of them all shined up a couple days ago and really pretty uh, Sarah said, I don't know how you were able to walk away from the bed frame for the guest room. Of course, we couldn't see the price. It was stunning. It was so pretty. So the price of it was $1,500, um, which as an antique bed frame goes, pretty darn good. And all the parts were there, like the boards on the side and all the metal, like the whatever, you know, the platform. 
But I would have to have somebody set that whole bed up for me. I'd have to have, see it like on a level surface to like check the integrity of the bed. Um, not that we couldn't brace it up here after the fact, because I grew up with an antique bed and my dad was always working on it. Because like, <laughs> like in the middle of the night, one of the boards underneath would fall out and my whole mattress would be like, boom, <laughs> and I'd wake up rolling off the bed. Um, didn't happen very often, but yeah, antique beds can be tricky. Next video was big changes coming to the gazebo. And in that video, we gave you a tour kind of of our gazebo and just let you know that we are planning on donating the gazebo to our city. And we are putting in a Hartley Botanic Victorian Grand Lodge greenhouse, which is like the, it's my bucket list item. Like that's my big bucket list item. It's kind of it's the bucket surreal. list item that you didn't really want to put on your bucket list because it seemed out of out reach. Out of reach, yeah. I mean, just this opportunity, I mean, it's, it's been in the works for a few years. I mean, you know, we've been talking to Hartley Botanic for three years at this point. You know, they sent some representatives out here, like flew them out here a few years ago, and it just wasn't a reality then. I didn't think it was a reality now. I mean, we've hinted at like, well, maybe it would happen, you know, but in my heart of hearts. I was like, this isn't going to happen. Yeah. You know, it's just like kind of a pipe dream and I cannot believe that it's happening. Like we just kind of decided to do it. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't even something that I'd been holding on to information for a long time or anything like that. Well, you've been, you've been, uh, yeah, we've been open cause you've said that you've wanted one all along. Yeah. Um, but, but well, yeah, it did happen pretty quick. So it'll be an interesting spring with a brand new baby and that construction and that being there where the gazebo is, is going to create a lot of upheaval in other areas of our garden, which is necessary um, in terms of trenching and things. But I think it'll be a good opportunity to really readdress some of the other areas in our garden, like the brick patio, the random area that um, we've talked about tearing out. We have to plow right through that with a trencher. May as well take that area up. Um, even though I have no idea what we're going to do with that space. You know what I was thinking? Um, we can probably just mulch a lot of areas that we don't know what we're going to do with for just a little bit. Even if for like a year, they stayed just mulched uh -huh. or two years. Yeah. Um, I was really impressed with putting mulch down and just using that as like a walking path behind I the did gazebo. It behind it, yeah. It, it's like kind of fluffy and, and light and it's not hard. Um, it also creates interesting lines, I think, with your plants because it kind of the pathway follows the, the curvature of your plants. Yeah. And so it's not like this strict walkway. It's yeah. a very much more like undulating free look. So anyway, I think we can just rip out the bricks and just uh, when we're done with the area, just put mulch down and then get to it when we get to it. I think... I think what I would like to do is get rid of the bricks and the tool shed and put something else because the tool shed looks like it's leaning. Mm -hmm. um, and then probably the pines and the junipers that are kind of all crummy. And there's a crummy old crab apple under there too that I kind of like, it's not getting enough light. It never has. So it's always a very meager, you like, you don't even see it because mm -hmm. it's all like kind of caught up in the evergreen trees. Um, and apparently there's a concrete pad underneath all those bricks is what we've been told. I think that, yeah, we'll find out when we when we get there. Mm -hmm. But there's for sure a concrete barrier underneath the circle area. Yeah, we ran into that this last year. I just remembered how many bulbs we planted in that, like twelve hundred daffodils. Oh yeah, we're gonna we'll have to well, rip we'll through just, it before we'll just da dag, dag them up, dig them up, dig them up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyway, Allison said, "Just curious. When you spoke of moving, you seemed like you had zero qualms about leaving here." You can't live in a greenhouse. Wouldn't it be better to move a, to a house, place, or community you love and then put it there? I don't, I still don't have a lot of qualms because we talked to Hartley and they have moved greenhouses before. So it's possible for us to move the Hartley if we want to, to a new location. But I, I don't know. I mean, we were just kind of like, it was just something we were toying with and we are kind of impulsive, a, li a little bit impulsive <laughs> about things like that. And we, I mean, we end up, I think we've been saved from making some pretty weird decisions in the past things that haven't worked out that I'm so thankful didn't work out I feel like we're exactly where we need to be mm -hmm. and I feel like this is a good spot for our kids because both of their grandparents are here I don't know there's just there's a lot of benefits to staying here schools are not one of them yeah. <laughs> that's my one my one thing so I but we don't have to worry about that here for a few more years two more years Benjamin will be going to school in two years can you believe that? That's crazy. 
Uh, B. Polson said, will this greenhouse replace your cold frame? No, we're going to still keep our cold frame. Everything's got a different purpose. The greenhouse that we're putting in the Hartley is going to be more of a living space because it's it's like a lifestyle piece. Like it's like a, an extension of your home and it will be heated and cooled. Um, and I want to set it up like for dining. Like I would love to entertain in there. I, I want plants in there obviously too, but more along the lines of tropicals and citrus, not so much production oriented like the cold frame is. Van said, since the greenhouse is glass, don't you have to be careful for any hail that might hit it or with windstorms? What if it smashes something into the glass? And that's one of the considerations of like why we're thinking about taking out the trees around it because they are diseased. I mean, they have blight. Um, and we do get some pretty horrendous windstorms. And so we thought, you know, it'd be a good opportunity at this point, since we kind of need to excavate the area anyway, let's just get rid of the diseased trees and we won't have to worry about that. I'm not sure about hail though. Have you read it up and any I hail? Can't, we don't get, you know, golf ball size Yeah, hail. It, it's not a worry for us. And I know this glass is like specific. Like yeah. it's. My guess is that uh, it would be able to stand up to it. I, I'd be really surprised if it couldn't. Paula said, I'm so excited for you. Could you explain the reasons or advantages for each of your structures, your cold frame, your high tunnel, your studio, grow lights, and now your greenhouse? So cold frame, the benefit of that is that we can shelter things without, um, like it's a good cold, cold growing area, really. Mm -hmm. Like right now we have perennials and some shrubs in there that we're wintering over. They technically don't need to be in there because it's so mild right now. Um, but it's just a really nice, area that keeps the edge off. It keeps the edge off with the sun because we've got the shade cloth over it in the summer. And then it takes the edge off in the winter because it keeps it maybe like roughly 20 degrees warmer mm -hmm. than the ambient temperature outside. We're looking into heating the cold frame, which is actually very simple. Um, what it entails is putting instead of one layer of greenhouse plastic, you put two and then you cut a hole in it. I don't know how we're, we're watching Creekside Nurseries video right now. <laughs> they're, they're putting in some greenhouses and they're doing like, they're doing it in steps and they're going to be heated, but there's some kind of motor you can put in there that just pushes air between these two layers of the greenhouse, which creates like an insulation bubble. Um, so it's not technically like heated. You can yeah, put a well, heater it is. in there. That's what you do is you put a heater in there. The insulation just makes it to where the heater doesn't have to work so hard 24 oh, Okay. So there is a small heater in there and then there's the motor that pushes air into the walls. So we've got the infrastructure sitting there, minus the motor and the heater. Mm -hmm. um, but we're looking into doing that so that I can maybe do more seed starting out in that greenhouse because the studio, honestly, we would love to have that free of all grow lights. I would like that. Mm -hmm. I would like the studio to be completely like just for filming because grow lights do take up a lot of space. Uh, so like eventually maybe. And then the high tunnel will be used as more cold storage because you can do the plastic instead of having it all open like we did where you could see all the way through from one side to the, the next, we trimmed the plastic off. You can actually take the plastic and like just bunch it up on the ground kind of mm -hmm. like off the end and then close it up. So we could kind of close it up for winter and, and store our shrubs and perennials in there that we have. They call them season extenders. And I yeah. think that's a really apt name for those. Mm -hmm. So high tunnel is think of it as a season extender. Mm -hmm. You can grow things sooner. And I think a lot of people grow crops directly in the ground. Yeah. Inside. It's like a giant row cover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a giant row cover. And so I think people buy them for production. Mm -hmm. That's the most cost effective way. Uh -huh. The cold frame that we have is like the next step up right. in terms of cost. But so the still high tunnel we got expensive. from Grower's Friend, Farmer's, Farmer's Friend. Friend. Farmer's Friend. We got the Gothic Arch Greenhouse from Farm Tech. Yeah, which is the same as Grower Supply. Grower Supply. And then all the grow lights in the studio came from Gardener Supply. I'm trying to think of all the... And then the new greenhouse is from Hartley Botanic. But there's also, you know, way more inexpensive greenhouses. You know, glass houses or plastic, look, you know, like, glass like houses. A, what do they call it? It's like poly... Um, yeah, like corrugated plastic or yeah, whatever. Yeah, and those work really well too. Yeah. There's a lot of different options out there and it just, it you depends on your size your and budget. your budget and all of those things. Um, and it's kind of fun to have been able to have the opportunity to try out some different things. I mean, the cold frame we had, it's been a game, it was a game changer. It was the best purchase um, that we made. Like, I'm glad we decided to do that first out of everything because we've used that thing so much, mm -hmm. so much. Uh, Debbie said, a dream come true. I'm so happy for you. Do you envision a pathway of any sort across the grass? <laughs> He's like, hello. Hi, buddy. 
Um, or will the lawn remain uninterrupted? I have no idea. I was just telling Aaron, was it last night? I'm like, I need to get Klaus Dalby on, on my yeah. design. Maybe I can email him and he will help me design all the way around the greenhouse. Wouldn't that be awesome? Talented. He's a talented designer and I love his garden so much. And at, at, at least, like, he wouldn't have to design all the plants, but like the hardscape, um, like the general layout. Mm -hmm. I think it would be fun to collaborate on something like that. Uh, Iliata said, so exciting. Just a quick question though. How do you, does a glass house fit in with your super hot climate? Wouldn't everything burn in the summer? Well, we will have an AC unit in that glass house, but we also opted to get all the shades. So there's different shades that you can get that pull down and that take, it's kind of like shade cloth. Mm -hmm. essentially and that really does help a lot we'll have fans in there so we're, we're going to have so it's kind of like three parts almost like you have your door in the center I'm gonna have a chandelier dropped in the center right there and then on the two sides we'll have fans going and we'll probably have floor fans going to help push air around um, so I'm thinking we won't even have to run the AC unit and, until it's like really really warm um, because I think we'll be able to regulate it it'll be warm in there but that's mm -hmm. okay we will also have automatic vents so oh, when right, it gets the, to a certain uh, heat temperature, the windows they will, open. They will open up in the top, letting out all the yeah. hot air. And we'll go over all of the specs of our greenhouse and like what we decided to go with because there's tons of accessories, and there's some things we opted to have and some things that we didn't think were maybe worth the money. I, we don't know that. We don't know. <laughs> so it's going to be an experience. Uh, we need some experience with it first. Yeah. Um, Jane said, life is really happening quick for you and Aaron. Yes, it is. What will you have in your new greenhouse? Will you also entertain in it? I think I already answered that question. Yes to entertaining. I kind of want it to be like, I want to be able to take my computer out and do some work out there. I want to be able to, um, like film videos like this too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause like the studio is awesome and I'm so thankful to have it because we've used it on some inclement weather days, even though it's not finished, it's pretty raw still. Um, but we prefer to be somewhere natural with natural light if it's favorable, yeah. but it's not always favorable. Um, so it'll be nice to have more options to do things like that. I think it would be fun to like in the winter time to have friends over and do wreath, like a wreath get together where I can show them how to make a wreath and then we can just like have food and make wreaths together in the Harley. Mm -hmm. Like that kind of thing would be really fun. Okay, B. Adam said, your children's college fund money, <laughs> getting a bit ostentatious perhaps? Look, listen, <laughs> when you have the opportunity to get a Hartley Botanic Greenhouse, you don't think about it. You just... You just do it. You just do it. Well, we did think about it we, though. We did, we thought about it for like almost three years. Yeah. Um, honestly, like it, it was a pipe dream for me and I don't think that Aaron and I are actually Hartley Botanics demographic <laughs> to be completely honest. Like they're giving us a really good discount. We have a lot of skin in the game still a lot. So <clears throat> that's why it took us so long because we needed to prepare for it and we need to be ready for it. Um, but we, f we thought, and actually when we were considering the pros and cons of getting a Hartley Botanic, like there are any cons, <laughs> we actually thought, you know, we didn't want to appear like we didn't want to push it like or become or get things that seemed unrelatable or I don't know how to, it is. It is pretty unrelatable it to is. most people. Well, it was to me, yeah. you know, up until this point, And I totally understand that. And I think that there were a few comments along those lines. So I just kind of wanted to talk about it um, because it's not something I ever thought I would have. And I but I also feel like in order to continue doing what we do, we've got to do interesting things. And there really wasn't or isn't videos out there showing a greenhouse like this going in like from ground up from excavating um to all of the you know to the end game to where it's all you know decorated and we're like using it um so i thought it would be a really fun opportunity to show that in videos on the flip side there's a million videos out there showing you the cheapest greenhouses or like the most inexpensive way to do things sure so if we're trying to justify the thing, I suppose we could say that we're kind of filling a void in the... That's right. We're doing <laughs> everybody a service, <laughs> a great service <laughs> by putting this in. And as far as children's college fund money, that's a whole different subject. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if I should get into that or not. Caitlin said, I know you've been dreaming about this for years and we've been dreaming right alongside you. Will you be getting the red brick base or one of the other stone options? Um, 
so I think we are, we're doing a brick base. I haven't decided exactly what tone and we're doing white on the top. And we were kind of flip flopping. Well, Erin, you kind of thought the exact one that I stood in at, at Beetham would be nice. It was a brick base, but it had a cream top and it is beautiful in that setting especially. But I think if you would put a cream, if you were to put a cream greenhouse in our location with all the white vinyl fencing, the white house, the white barn, the white chicken coop, I think it would look dingy. So I think white will look really good. We have a lot of brick and we've started replacing all of our walkways with brick. So it'll look like a continuation of that same idea and then black accents. And that's kind of how we've gone. Like the house is white with black accents, barn is white with black accents. If the greenhouse is white and we use like black containers, like some black iron urns, which I just bought two of, and that's kind of where I'm thinking of using them. Mm -hmm. I think that that would be a very cohesive look. And also they've got, like I want, I was waffling between white or black because they've got gorgeous black greenhouses and they look so like, like moody. I don't know, like, I don't know what kind of, like how to explain what they look like, but they look so like sophisticated style, but they do disappear. Black tends to disappear. It tends to um, not like stand out quite as much. And I kind of want to have this to stand out. I want to be like, this is a Hartley. <laughs> Look at that Hartley across the grass. Like you can see it there. It's like shining like a beacon and it's beautiful. Um, and that's kind of what I've always thought like growing up and like when I really started to get into gardening years and years ago, um, like legit in my adult years, I've always kind of pictured a white one. So I think it'll be nice. Also white doesn't show hard water or dirt as bad as black and black would be a nightmare here. Allison said, question, are you going to save your basketball roses? Uh, yes, I, I do plan on saving quite a number of plants that are around that gazebo. In fact, we'll have quite a few videos of relocating some of those things. There will be some things that I'll give to friends or family. Um, there's really not a lot around it that I, that's like bad. I think it'll either be relocated in a different area in our garden or it'll go to a different garden, mm -hmm. um, except for the big trees. Okay, and then the last two videos are the new shrubs for 2021. So I just thought it would be fun because this time of year we kind of always go through the new plants that are coming out in the Proven Winners line in particular. Um, and they have 30 shrubs this year, which is an insane amount of new shrubs. So since there was 30 shrubs, we broke it into two videos. I went through 17 of the shrubs in the first one, 13 in the second one, just because it can get kind of long when I'm talking about all the details of these plants. So uh, Fran in the first one said, can butterfly bush blooms be used for arrangements? Yes. Uh, number two, are there any barberry varieties without thorns? Thorns are a deal breaker for me. They are also a deal breaker for Erin. You do not like barberries, but did you know? I Googled it. There are some varieties that don't have thorns. Oh, wow. Or they say they're nearly thornless. Nearly thornless. Like there's one that's actually called thornless, what I found online. I have no experience with that, that variety or any varieties that don't have thorns. So I can't really speak a lot about it. But if you Google it, there are, I guess, some new hybrid barberries out there that don't have thorns. I do believe this one does have thorns, the, ones I sh the one I showed. Neo, Sunjoy, beautiful color, ugh. AS said, can the hydrangeas be kept in a container? Absolutely. Now, you just have to keep in mind the size of the container and the size of the mature hydrangea. So of course, the smaller hydrangeas will stay uh, in containers for a lot longer because they just don't need as much room for growth. Um, the larger size hydrangeas will need a little bit more room for growth. If you plant them in a container, they'll naturally stay a little bit smaller anyway, but I've done hydrangeas in containers quite a number of times and they do really well for, for us. Uh, Dylan said, so many new and exciting things. One question, what pruning group are those new clematis? So there's a new group of clematis called Sparky, Sparky Pink, Purple, and Blue. Um, they are all an atrogene type clematis, which makes them a group one. They bloom on old wood, which means that um, no pruning is necessary on this type of clematis. Uh, if you do want to clean them up a little bit, the best time to do it is immediately after their first like big spring flush of bloom. These particular clematis are technically like that spring bloomer. They will throw up some sporadic blooms though through the rest of the season. So you do get some color on them later on too. Uh, Ruth said, I'm in the Highlands of Scotland on the very north coast, zone nine, I think. If a plant is listed as, say, a zone four through seven, does that mean it wouldn't suit a zone nine? Uh, would it have to be, say, zone four through nine or ten for it to be safe to plant in a zone nine area? Sorry if this is a stupid question. It's not a stupid question. A lot of people wonder that, and I wondered that at one time, too. Um, if your plant, if you live in a zone nine and a plant is a zone four through seven, it means that that plant, that particular zone four through seven plant needs to have a specific amount of cold 
in order to produce and to perform. Um, sometimes they need that they need that vernalization cold period in order to form buds for blooms uh, or just they need a resting period and if it's too warm where you're at and they don't get that um, then they just won't they won't thrive in your area. Mary said, you clearly expressed your excitement in this video. I think it was one of your quickest videos. It was. When I watched it, I told Aaron, like, maybe we should slow this thing down. Can we slow it, like, like a quarter of a speed, like a percent down or a quarter of a... You can do that in YouTube. Can you do that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was just, like, rocking. I didn't feel like I was talking fast. But, um, yeah, some things do kind of make me excited, though. <laughs> Um, where can I go to find out more about these plants or uh, shrubs, shade and sun tolerance, that sort of thing? Uh, we linked all of them in the description of the video. So if you check below the video, you can click a link to any one of them that you're interested in and read up a little bit more. Queen Bee said, I'm getting excited about spring planting too. When do you suggest is a good time to start placing orders from online retailers like Proven Winners? I think the best thing you, you can do is if you have a local garden center, check there first because they're all working on their orders as well right now. And that's the best route to go um, because they will order it in from a grower um, and you can look at it, you can see it. Um, and yeah, so go down there, talk to somebody who's doing placing the orders, have them look for it. Um, and then, and you can do that anytime now is great. Uh, also online orders, I know everybody's doing like pre-orders right now. So it's a good time to do that too, if that's your option. Um, and they of course won't ship it out until the weather's nice enough to do so. Um, but yeah, getting in, if you have something you know you want, get in, get it in as early as possible, your order. Uh, Margaret said, will the lo and behold butterfly bush grow in a container? Yes, it will. In fact, we did a container, a galvanized container with a uh, butterfly bush in it like, oh, four years ago. I gave it to my parents and they yeah. had it out by their pool all year. Uh, Kay said, are these butterfly bushes legal in Oregon? Yes, they are. Now I can't grow like the pugster. Um, butterfly bushes which i've thought about like going across the border and buying a couple because we're like on the border of idaho and oregon i can buy pugsters like five minutes down the road if i can find them at a nursery but um some of the butterfly bushes are termed a noxious weed in oregon and so we're lumped into the whole they're not noxious on the eastern side of the state but they are on the western side and um, we just get lumped into the whole lot um anyway but the lo and behold in the mist series like Miss Violet, Miss Ruby, um, all of those are sterile, so we can grow them here. Ashley said, I've heard from one source that the limelight prime hydrangea will also be more iron tolerant and won't get chlorosis as much as the regular limelight. Have you heard anything about that? No, I haven't. And if that's the case, that's awesome because we deal with chlorosis on a lot of our plants. However, the limelights aren't one of them. Have you ever noticed? Our oh, just a little bit. Really? Yeah, just a little bit. Oh, I'm like how emphatic I am about yeah. it. Like, nope, never dealt with that. Um, I haven't personally noticed a problem on our limelights, but Aaron says he's noticed a little bit. So. I wouldn't call it like problem territory. I would call it noticeable territory. So the limelight prime might be a really good, if yeah. that is true, and I don't know. Um, I mean, time will tell. We're going to plant some next year. Uh, Nick said, bit off topic, but will you be attempting asparagus, asparagus again? Yes, I would love to. It was so so sad when we got ready to do our chicken coop there were two random raised beds like right out in the middle of our driveway area they didn't really get enough sun and drove Aaron crazy they weren't uh, straight either no they like weren't. they were all off yeah and like not parallel each other really um but I planted some asparagus in them and it takes three years to be able to start harvesting your asparagus and we were on our third year it was going to be our third year and we had to have them all ripped up so that Chad could get in and out to get that uh, root cellar taken out I mean, it was a small price to pay for the chicken coop, but yeah, I want to do it again. Okay, so moving on to the other video, which was part two of the new shrubs for 2021. Garden Ideas said, why are some plants restricted in some places? Um, it's, it's because some plants will grow rampantly. Like some plants will seed themselves everywhere. They'll spread everywhere and then they become noxious to a point where it's hard to control them. So like butterfly bushes, for example, I just talked about that. They are a noxious weed in Oregon. So um, on the western side of the state, the conditions are just favorable for them. And um, in terms of they'll like drop seed everywhere and just come up everywhere. And it gets really hard to take care of them. Um, here on the eastern side of the state, that doesn't happen. But we have like morning glories and noxious weed, uh, puncture vine or goat heads are a noxious weed. Um, so, you know, there are some states where you can't grow barberries because, or buckthorns for 
another example um, because the traditional varieties usually spread like crazy, but they've been improved on. Like there are a uh, fine line buckthorn, for example, is not, it's still restricted in some areas because it's, it's a buckthorn, but it doesn't produce, it hardly produces any viable seeds. And then of the seeds it does produce, like 2% of them come up. So they're being bred to be better and not, to not take over and to be more like keep to themselves sort mm -hmm. of plants. But Hope said, does the new Miss Kim really stay that small? So it's called Baby Kim. And yes, it's supposed to stay that small. Daniel said, how close together do you have to plant the yin and yang uh, viburnums right next to each other? Or is there leeway for plants in between? Yes, you can plant plants in between. Typically, it's like a 50 foot range. I mean, the closer you can get them together, the better because, you know, pollinators don't have to travel as far, but usually you want to have them within 50 feet of each other. Uh, Sharon said, I've just discovered you on YouTube and I love your videos. I'm curious as to if this is your job, do you own a nursery business? Do you work for Proven Winners? I'm interested to learn more about what you do and why. So YouTube is our job. Creating video content is our job. Um, it became that way kind of gradually. We started off, kind of talked about this I think earlier, but um, we worked our full-time jobs for two years before we decided to kind of take the leap and make it make YouTube our full-time job. My parents do have a garden center. However, we're not, we don't work there. I worked there for a number of years and I still get a very good discount there, family discount there, but I get that whether or not we were doing a YouTube channel or not. Um, we, we work with proven winners. We don't work, we're for. not in, we, yeah, we don't work for them. We're not an employee of proven winners, but we do work with them. Um, so anyways, yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing how it's all kind of worked out. Which means you can say whatever you want. Yeah, it does. Like, name one of their plants that you really don't like. Hold on. Let me think about it, because there are some I don't like. I don't like red roses. They've got red... I don't like landscape roses in general. Like, I like bigger... Like, their Atlas rose was, like, the first one. I'm like, yes, I can get behind this rose. But I'm not a huge landscape rose fan. Um, they have their place. I don't know. There's just like, oh, Dianthus. I'm not a huge Dianthus fan. They've got a bunch of them. They are really pretty in the spring, though. Yeah, for like a few weeks when they're <laughs> blooming. And then like go out there and have to deadhead those beasts. I don't think so. I mean, you can cut them all the way back, but I never experienced like a super great flushback of bloom on those. And so I'm just, I've kind of written them off a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tammy said, what is the zone for the rose? I think I forgot to mention the rose zone, which um, the Ringo, I shouldn't say that I don't like all their landscape roses because I'm excited about the color on this one. Um, beautiful color. And maybe that's why like a lot of the landscape roses seem to like, I don't know, I always just think of like a red flower carpet rose or something. Uh, zone four through eight on the Ringo All-Star Rose. Uh, Eva said, does Proven Winners ask that you omit the light requirements for these new plants? No. As a gardener with primarily shade and part shade conditions, it would be so appreciated if you would be allowed to include the light requirements. I, it was just, that's just an oversight on my part. I just didn't even think about it. I can include or not include any information that I want <laughs> in the videos. Um, I'm not restricted in any so way. So long as it's factual. Yeah. They probably would take issue if you just started saying things like that were not things. true. Like random yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like you can plant this rose in dead shade. Like, yeah. <laughs> like it's going to bloom beautifully for you. I don't know. I think there's a, quite a bit of trust that goes into that we have in our relationship um, with Proven Winners and with uh, the other companies that we do work with, uh, which is so nice because there's not a lot of, um, I don't know, we're not in each other's business a lot in terms of like directing how things yeah. go. Um, Kim said, I always go, ah, whenever you talk about viburnums because I know you want them so bad. We can have quite a number of viburnums, but there's a few that we can't. Will you be utilizing your new greenhouse when the time comes to be able to grow all the things you can't because of your zone? Can you imagine a whole greenhouse smelling of viburnum? That would be a glorious thing. And I'm not sure. We're going to have to work out the temperature in there, like figure out. It's going to be a learning curve to figure out what can, we can put in there. It might be too warm for those viburnums. I'm not sure. I'm guessing I'm going to have a lot of citrus um, because I like citrus. I mean, I've got three of them in here that are doing phenomenally well. Um, and like, I don't know. I don't know. But, yeah. I think between the venting and the fans, I think that we'll we'll be okay. Yeah, I'm just worried about wintering over. Like even those viburnums, I want to make sure that if I if I did those, I would have to make sure that it didn't stay too warm all winter long. Like yeah. they'd have to be cool. 
um, and I might even treat it somewhat like this room. This room is not heated. I keep um, typically uh, uh, mangaves. I had a bunch of mangaves and, uh, and agaves down here before I moved all the lemon cypress in and the citrus, which don't usually like to be very cold. Um, and it gets cold out here, but I run a little floor heater that turns on if it hits a certain degree. Um, so it takes the edge off the cold and everything performs better out here. Um, given that cold rather than staying too warm. Um, last question, Monster Bug said, thank you so much for the info. We had two oleanders in our garden and actually pulled them out as they are extremely toxic to animals and cause skin irritations for us. Would you mind including if a plant is toxic in future videos? It's like, I know that's a thing. It's just so not on my radar because I, I've never had an animal or seen a child, like or known of a child in well, my... you've never, you worked at the vet clinic for how many years? Five and a half years. And you never once saw a single person come in due to... Plant toxicity. Plant toxicity. Not one time. Yeah, and so it's really hard because I just don't even think about it. And then, like, Benjamin's growing up around all kinds of stuff. I grew up around all kinds of stuff. And you just learn growing up what you can and can't eat or touch. Um, and I know that you can't, like, always catch everything. Um, that an animal or a kid is doing, but I don't know. I don't like talking about plant toxicity either because I think it, it is like an immediate turn off to people. Like it, it creates fear where there really shouldn't be any. Yeah, I think that's a really apt uh, explanation. Bravo. It's like no one should live in a home because it might get broken into. Yeah. Like certainly your might your home might get be broken into. You but... always take things to extremes though. <laughs> like you always, <laughs> I don't know. Well, it is, it is kind of a good analogy, though, because there's a lot of things like you shouldn't drive your car because it's dangerous. Well, certainly there's some danger by getting in a vehicle, but I don't think it goes that it. far, though. I can totally see this. Like people just want to make sure like I want to make sure that the things I'm putting in my garden, I don't have to worry about. And if you deal with worrying about things like that, I can see that eliminating something like that would be nice. Make, make it be it. It'd make you be able to relax in your space without yeah. feeling like paranoid that somebody was going to eat something. There was a lot. I mean, this person, this person who commented was not the only one. Yeah. There were a lot of people who commented on the toxicity and it's just, yeah, it's like an afterthought for me. I'm sorry. Okay. I think that that's it for this week's recap video. And you know, who knows when we're going to do another one. We do have um, some projects lined up for this week, and I don't know what our posting schedule is going to be like at all, um, but we really appreciate your, all of your support. I mean, so many of you guys are excited to uh, virtually meet her, and I'm excited to introduce her. I'm excited to meet her myself, um, but it's going to be very interesting next week because I have to be in the hospital for a couple of days, and um, we can't have visitors because of COVID. It'll just be Erin and I and the baby girl, which will be nice in one hand, but maybe we'll do... Maybe we'll have like some. We'll have time on our hands. Yeah. Maybe we could do a little, like, we'll do a live, live, video. live stream or something <laughs> like that. I don't know. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching this, and we will see you in the next one. Bye.